Live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE. Covering Red Hat Summit 2018. Brought to you by Red Hat. Hello, welcome back everyone. This is theCUBE's exclusive coverage here in San Francisco, California for Red Hat Summit 2018. I'm John Furrier, co-host of theCUBE with my analyst co-host this week, John Troyer, co-founder of The Reckoning um, Advisory Services. And our next guest is Arvind Krishna, who's the Senior Vice President of Hybrid Cloud at IBM and Director of IBM Research. Welcome back to theCUBE, good to see you. Hey, John and John, great so to meet you guys. Just, yeah. You can't get confused, you've got two Johns here. Great <laughs> to have you on because you guys are doing some uh, deals with Red Hat, obviously the leader at open source. You guys are one of them as well, contributing to Linux. It's well documented in the IBM history books uh, on your role and relationship to Linux. So, you know, check, check. But you guys are doing a lot of work with cloud in, in a way that, you know, frankly is very specific to IBM, but also has a large industry impact. Not like the classic cloud. So I want to tie the, 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 the knot here and put that together. So first I got to ask you, uh, take a minute to talk about why you're here um, with Red Hat. What's the update with IBM with Red Hat? Uh, yeah, great John, thanks, and thanks for giving me the time. I'm going to talk about it in two steps. One, I'm going to talk about a few common tenets between IBM and Red Hat, and then I'll go from there to the specific news. So for the context. We both believe in Linux. I think that's easy to state. <laughs> we both believe in containers. I think that's the next thing to state, and we'll come back and talk about containers because this is a world, containers are linked to Linux, containers are linked to these technologies called Kubernetes, containers are linked to how you make workloads portable across many different environments, both private and public. Then I go on from there to say, and we both believe in hybrid. Hybrid meaning that people want the ability to run their workload wherever they want, be it on a private cloud, be it on a public cloud, and do it without having to rewrite everything as you go across. Okay, so let's establish those are the market needs. So then you come back and say, and IBM has a great portfolio of middleware, names like WebSphere and DB2, and I can go on and on, and Red Hat has a great uh, uh, footprint of Linux in the enterprise. So now you say, we got the market need of hybrid, we got these two things, which between them have tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of endpoints. How do you make that need get fulfilled by this? And that's what we just announced here. So we announced that IBM middleware will run containerized on Red Hat containers on Red Hat Enterprise Linux. In addition, we said IBM Cloud Private, which is the ability to bring all of the IBM middleware in a sort of a cloud-friendly form, right? You click and you install it, it keeps itself up, it doesn't go down, it's elastic in a set of technologies we call IBM Cloud Private, running in turn on Red Hat um, OpenShift container service on Red Hat Linux. So now for the first time, if you say I want private, I want public, I want to go here, I want to go there, you have a complete certified stack that is complete. I think I can say we are unique in the industry in giving you this. This is, and this is, where the, this is kind of where the fruit comes on the tree, off the tree for you guys, because you know, we've been following you guys for years. You know, and everyone's, where's the cloud strategy? And first of all, it's not a, you don't have a cloud strategy, you have cloud products, right? So you have to deliver the goods. You got the, so just to replay, the market need we all know is the hybrid cloud, multi-cloud, choice, et cetera, et cetera. Right. You take Red Hat's footprint, your capabilities, your combined install base is foundational. Right. So, and you, nothing needs to change. There's no lift and shift, there's no rip and replace. You can, it's out there, it's foundational. That's now, on top of it, is where the action is. That's what we're, that's what we're kind of getting at, right? That's correct. So, so we can go into somebody, they're running a, let's say, a massive online banking application, or they're running a reservation system, it's using technologies from us, it's using Linux underneath, and today it's all a bunch of P-spots, you have a huge complex stuff, it's all hardwired and rigidly nailed down to the floor in a few places, and now you can say, hey, I'll take the application, I don't have to rewrite the application, I can containerize it, I can put it here, and that same app now begins to work, but in a way that's a lot more fluid and elastic. Oh, by the way, I want to do a bit more work, I want to expose a bit of it up as microservices, I want to insert some AI, you can go do that. You want to fully make it microservices enabled to be able to make it into little components and digestible, you can do that. So you can take it in sort of bite-sized chunks and go from one to the other at the pace that you want. And that's game changing. Yeah, that's what I really like about this announcement. I mean, it really brings uh, best of breed together, right? You, did, you know, there's a lot of talk about containers uh, and legacy, and we, you know, we've been talking about what goes where, and do you have to break everything up, like you were just saying. But the the announcement today, you know, WebSphere, the this the you know a, a, a 
battle tested, uh, uh, huge enterprise scale component, DB2, those things containerized and also in a framework like with IBM, uh, either with IBM microservices and, and application development things or others, right? That's, um, that's a huge uh, endorsement for OpenShift as a platform. Absolutely, it is. And, and look, we would be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit. I mean, we use the word containers and containers a lot. Yes, you're right, containers is a really, really important technology. But what containers enable is much more than prior attempts such as VMs and all have done. Containers really allow you to say, hey, I solved the security problem, I solved the patching problem, the restart problem. All those problems that lie around the operations of a typical enterprise can get solved with containers. VMs solved a lot about isolating the infrastructure, but they didn't solve uh, as John was saying, the top half of the stack. And yeah. that's, I think, the huge power here. Yeah, well, I want to just double click on that because I think the containers thing is interesting because, you know, first of all, being in the media and, lo and loving what we do, we're kind of a new kind of media company, but uh, traditional media has been throwing IBM under the bus and saying, whoa, you know, old guard and, and all these things. But here's the thing. You don't have to change anything. You could containers, you can essentially wrap it up and then bring a microservices architecture into it so you can actually leverage at cloud scale, so what interests me is, is that you can move instantly value proposition wise, pre-existing market, cloudify it, if you will, with operational capabilities. And right. this is where I like the cloud private, so I want to kind of go there for a second. If I have a need to take what I have at IBM, whether it's WebSphere, no, I got developers, I got install base, I don't have to put a migration plan, away, I containerize it, thank you very much. I do some cloud native stuff, but I want to make it private. My use case is very specific, maybe it's confidential, maybe it's like a government region, Whatever, I can create a cloud operations. Is that right? I can That's cloudify <laughs> it and run it? Absolutely correct. So when we look at cloud private, to go down that path, we said cloud private allows you to run on your private infrastructure. But I want all these abilities you just described, John. I want to be able to do microservices, I want to be able to scale up and down, I want to be able to say operations happen automatically. So it gives you all that, but in the private without having to go all the way to the public. So if you care a lot about, you're in a regulated industry because you went down government or confidential data, or you say, this data is so sensitive, I don't really, I'm not going to take the risk of it being anywhere else. It yeah. absolutely gives you that ability to go do that. And, uh, and that is what we brought Cloud Private to the market for, and then you combine it with OpenShift, and now you get the powers of both together. So you guys essentially have brought to the table the years of effort with Bluemix, all that good stuff going on, you can bring in, you can actually run this in any industry vertical. Uh, Pretty much, right? Absolutely. So if you look at what the past has been for the entire industry, it has been a lot about constructing a public cloud. Uh, not just us, but us and our competition. Yep. And a public cloud has certain capabilities, it has certain elasticity, it has a global footprint, but it doesn't have a footprint that's in every zip code or in every town or in every city. That's not going to happen to the public cloud. So we say, it's a hybrid world, meaning that you're going to run some workloads on a public cloud, I'd like to run some workloads on a private, and I'd like to have the ability that I don't have to pre-decide which is where. And that is what uh, the containers, the microservices, the OpenShift, that combination all gives you to say, you don't need to pre-decide. You, you rewrite the workload onto this, and then you can decide where it runs. Well, I was having this conversation with some folks at a uh, recent Amazon Web Services conference that said, well, if you go to cloud operations, then the on-premise, essentially the edge, it's not necessary, then the definition of on-premise really doesn't even exist. So if you have cloud operations, <laughs> in a way, what is the data center then? <laughs> it's just a connected uh, tissue. That's right, it's the infrastructure which you set up, yeah. uh, and then at that point, the software manages the data center as opposed to anything else, and that's kind of been the goal that we've all uh, been wanting. So it sounds like this is visibility into IBM's essentially execution plan from day one, we've been seeing and connecting the dots. Having the ability to take either pre-existing resources, foundational things like Red Hat or whatnot in the enterprise, not throwing it away, yeah. building on top of it, and having a new operating model with software, with elastic um, scale, horizontally scalable, synchronous, all those good things, enabling microservices with Kubernetes and containers, now for the first time, I could roll out new software development life cycles in a cloud native environment without foregoing legacy infrastructure and investment. Absolutely, and one more element, and if you want to insert some public cloud services into the environment, be it in private or in public, you can go do that. For example, you want to insert a couple of AI services into the middle of your application, you can go do that. So the environment allows you to do what you described and 
these additions. I want to talk about people for a second. The, the, the titles that we haven't mentioned, CIO, you know, business leader, business unit leaders, uh, how are they looking at digital transformation and business transformation uh, in your client base as you go out and talk to them? Look, um, so, so, so let's take a hypothetical bank. And every bank today is looking about at simple questions. How do I improve my customer experience? And everybody wants, when they say customer experience, they really do mean digital customer experience to make it very tangible. And what they mean by that is, how do I get my end customer engaged with me through an app? The app's probably on a device like this. Some smartphone, we won't say what it is. And, and so how do you do that? And so they say, well, well, you obviously want to uh, check your balance. You obviously want to maybe look at your credit card. You want to do all those things, the same things we do today. So that application exists. There is not much point in rewriting it. You might do the UI up, but it's an app that exists. Then you say, but I also want to give you information that's useful to you in the context of what you're doing. I want to say, you can get a 10 second loan, not a, not a 30 day loan, but a 10 second loan. I want to make an offer to you in the middle of you browsing credit cards. All those are new customer this thing, so how, where do you construct those apps? How do you mix and match it? How do you use all the capabilities along with the data you got to go do that? And what we're trying to now say, here is a platform that you can go all that, do all that on. Right, that complete life cycle you mentioned, the development life cycle, but I got to add to the, the data life cycle, as well as here is the versioning, here are my AI models, all those things built in into one platform. And scale's a huge, the new competitive advantage. You guys are enabling that. So I got to ask you on the question on, on multi-cloud. Obviously, as people start building out the cloud on-prem and with public cloud and the things you're laying out, I can see that going on for a while. A lot of work being done there. We're seeing that. Wookie Bond had a true private cloud report I thought was truly telling. Had a lot of growth there, still not going away. Public cloud certainly is growing, the numbers are clear. However, the word multi-cloud is being kicked around. I think it's more of a, of a future state, obviously, but people have multiple clouds. We'll have relationships with multiple clouds. No one's going to have one cloud. It's not a winner-take-all game. Winner-take-most, but you know, you're going to have multiple clouds. What does multi-cloud mean to you guys in your architecture? Because is that moving workloads in real time based upon spot pricing indexes? Or is that just co-locating on clouds and saying I got this app on that cloud, that app on that cloud, control plane data? These are architectural questions. So what a, the hell is multi-cloud? So there's a today and then there is a tomorrow and then there is a long future state, right? So let's take today. Let's take IBM. We run Salesforce. We run ServiceNow. We run Workday, we run uh, Success Factors. Well, all of these are different clouds. We run our own public cloud, we run our own private cloud, and we have traditional data center. And we might have some of the other clouds also through apps that we bought that we don't even know. Okay, so that's just us. I think every one of our clients is like this. So multi-cloud is here today. I begin with that first simple yeah. statement. Yeah. And I need to connect the data, I need to con connect when things go where. The next step, I think people, nobody's going to have only one even public cloud. I think even amongst the big public clouds, most people are going to have two, if not more. Yeah. That's today and tomorrow. Your channel partners have clouds, by the way. Your global SIs all have clouds. They all have the cloud. Cube is a cloud, for crying out loud. That's right. So then you go into the aspirational state, and that may be the one you said, where people do spot pricing. But even if I stay back from spot pricing and completely dynamic, and I'm worrying about network, and I'm worrying about video reach, if I just back up onto, but I may decide I have this app, I run it on private, well, but I don't have all the infrastructure, so I want to burst it today, and I've, where do I burst it to? I got to decide which public, and how do I go there? Yeah. And that's the problem of today, and we're doing that, and that is why I think multi-cloud is here now, yeah. not some point in the and future. And the problem, the problem statement there is latency, managing you know, service level agreements between clouds, and so on and so forth. Access managing. control on governance, uh, where does my data go, because there may be regulate, yeah. regulatory reasons to yeah. decide where the data can flow and all That's those things. That's a great point about the cloud. I never thought about that way. It's a good, good illustration. I would also say that I see the same argument in the database world. Not everyone has DB2, not everyone has Oracle, not everyone has, databases are everywhere. You have databases, part of IOT devices now. <laughs> so like, no one makes a decision on the database. Similar with right. cloud, you're seeing a similar dynamic. It's right. the glue layer that interests me. As you, how do you bring them together? So holistically, looking at the 20 mile stair in the future, what is the integration strategy long term? If you look at a distributed system or an operating system, there has to be a, an architectural guiding principle for Absolutely. integration. Your this thoughts? has been a world that's 30 years in the, in the making. So we can say networking, everybody had their own networking standards in the, let's say the 80s, though it probably goes back to the 70s, right? 
you had SNA, you had TCP IP, you had NetBIOS. DECnet. DECnet, <laughs> you can go on and on, and in the end, it's TCP IP that won out as the glue. Others, by the way, survived, but in pockets, and then TCP IP was the glue. Then you can fast forward 15 years beyond that, and HTTP became the glue, we call that the internet. Then you can fast forward and you can say, now how do I make applications portable? And I would turn around and tell you that containers on Linux with Kubernetes as orchestration is that glue layer. Now in order to make it so, just like in TCP IP, it wasn't enough to say TCP IP. You needed routing tables, you needed uh, DNS, you needed uh, name repositories, you needed all those things. Similarly, you need all those here, are called those catalogs and automation. So that's the glue layer that makes all of this work. This is important, I, I love this the conversation because we, I've been ranting on this in theCUBE for years, you nailed it. A new stack is developing, DNS, this is old internet infrastructure. Right. Cloud infrastructure at the global scale is seeing things like network effect. Okay, we see blockchain and token economics. Right. Databases, multiple databases, unstructured data. So a new plethora of new things are happening that are building on top of, say, HTTP. Correct. And this is the new opportunity. This is the new, the new platform which is emerging and it's going to enable businesses to operate, you said, at scale, to be very digital, to be very nimble. Application life cycles are not always going to be months, they're going to come down to days, and this is what gets enabled. So I want you to give your opinion, personal or IBM or whatever perspective, because I think you nailed the glue layer on Kubernetes, Docker, and these, this new glue layer that, and you made references to things like HTTP and TCP, which changed the industry landscape. Wealth creation, new, op, new, new brands emerged, companies we've never heard of emerged out of this, and we're all using them today. We expect a new set of brands are going to emerge, new technology is going to emerge. In your expert opinion, how gigantic is this swarm of new innovation going to be? Just because you've seen many ways before. In your view, in your mind's eye, what are you expecting? What, share your, your insight into how big of a shift and wave this is going to be and add some color to that. I think that if I take a, I'll take a shorter and then a longer term view. In the short term, I think that we said that this is on the order of $100 billion. That's not just our estimate, I think even Gartner estimates it about the same number. That'll be the amount of opportunity for new technologies in what we've been describing. And that is, I think, short term. If I go longer term, I think as much as a half, but at least a fourth of the complete IT market is going to shift onto these technologies. So then the winners are those that make the shift, and then by, by conclusion, the losers are those who don't make the shift fast enough. Yeah. And and after market moves, that's, yeah. that's huge. It's interesting, we used to like look at certain segments going back years, oh, this company's re-platformizing, re-platforming their, their lift and shift and all this stuff. What you're talking about here is so game-changing because the industry's re-platforming. That's, that's it's correct. It's not a company. That's correct. It's an industry. That's right. The, and, you, and, and I think the, the, the internet era of 1995, to put that point, is perhaps the easiest analogy to what is happening. The, not, the, not the emergence of cloud, not the emergence of all that. I think that was small steps. What we're talking about now is yeah. back to the 1995 statement. Every vertical is upgrading their stack across the board from e-commerce to whatever. That's right. It's completely modernizing. Correct. Around cloud. What we call digital transformation in a sense, yes. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of the word, but yes. I lie. I understand what you mean. Great insight, Arvind. Thanks for coming on theCUBE and sharing the first. We didn't even get to some of the other good stuff, but IBM and Red Hat doing some great stuff. Obviously, foundational. I mean, Red Hat, tier one, first class citizen in every single enterprise and software environment. You know, now open source runs the world. You guys, you guys are no um, um, stranger to Linux being the first billion dollar investment going back. So you guys have a heritage there. So congratulations on the relationship. I think 18 years ago, if I remember, 1999. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and I love the strategy. Hybrid cloud here at IBM and Red Hat. This is theCUBE bringing you all the action here in San Francisco. I'm John Furrier, John Troyer, more live coverage. Stay with us here in theCUBE, we'll be right back.